This program is made possible by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Maryland Humanities Council. <laughs> Michael Collier talks with Edward Hirsch. Welcome to The Writing Life. My name is Michael Collier, and I'm here today speaking with the poet Edward Hirsch. Um, it's a pleasure being here with you today, Edward. Thanks. Treat for me, too, Michael. Well, I'd like the, the audience to know that you're the author of five books of poems. First book, For the Sleepwalkers. Second book, While Gratitude was the winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award in 1986 and your most recent book, On Love, was published uh, two years ago. 98. 98. And uh, we'll be hearing mainly poems from On Love this afternoon. Uh, Edward is also the author of two collections of books on the art of poetry, uh, how to read a poem <laughs> and fall in love with poetry, and uh, responsive reading. Edward teaches at the University of Houston. He's a MacArthur Fellow. He's also received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and is, was a Rome Fellow. Um, how about starting with the poem? That will be a pleasure. I thought I'd begin with the poem called The Poet at Seven. I borrowed a title from Rambeau, who had a poem in French called The Poet at Seven. I liked the idea so much of reading your vocation back into your childhood that I decided to write this. So you'll see the idea is translated to an American key. The Poet at Seven. He could be any seven-year-old on the lawn holding a baseball in his hand, ready to throw. He has the middle-class innocence of an American, except for his blunt features and dark skin that mark him as a Palestinian or a Jew, his forehead furrowed like a question, his concentration camp eyes nervous, grim, and too intense. He has the typical blood of the exile, the refugee, the victim. Look at him looking at the catcher for a sign, so violent and competitive, so unexceptional except for an ancestral lamentation, a shadowy, grief-stricken need for freedom, laboring to express itself through him. Mm. One of the things that <clears throat> your work is preoccupied with, it seems to me, is creating these dialogues uh, with other poets. And uh, wh when did you begin to feel that that was coming into your work? Uh, directly I think it was I think it was always it's always been there I can't uh -huh. think of a time when it when it wasn't maybe it became more explicit there are poems in in my first book for the sleepwalkers that are very much poems of poetic apprenticeship and I thought of it as such there's a poem for example called a walk with Vallejo in Paris mm -hmm. where I imagine myself taking a walk with Caesar Vallejo around Paris and seeing what he saw mm -hmm. And um, at the end of that poem, he leaves me and takes me to apartment house and leaves me. And there's a poem called Walking the Upper West Side with Lorca, because Lorca, I was living at the Upper West Side in New York, and Lorca had been in that neighborhood mm -hmm. when he was writing the poems that became Poet in New York, a book that had meant a lot to me. And so I imagine walking around the Upper West Side with Lorca. Those were just poems that formalized my idea that other poets could lead you to your own work. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose that my mountaintop model for that, behind it I had in mind, was the relationship between Dante and Virgil. I've always been moved by the way that Dante, wanting to write this Italian epic, doesn't know what to do, how to do it, how to go about it. He's writing it in the vernacular, and he, he's going he's gonna, he's gonna go through hell, and he summons Virgil to help him, to help lead him. And the Russian poet Osip Mandelstam says, let's face it, Dante's a bit of a bumbler. <laughs> Without Virgil to lead him, where would he be? He wouldn't know how to behave. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that to me 
means the Inferno is based on the Aeneid and related to the Aeneid, <laughs> and especially the sixth book of the Aeneid, where Aeneas goes down into the underworld. And I'm, I was struck by that even in college that Dante needed Virgil mm -hmm. to help show him the way. Of course, he, the Virgil he wrote about was one he invented in mm -hmm. some ways. But I was struck that he was befriended by Virgil, mm -hmm. and Virgil helped lead him to his own work. There's a wonderful phrase that struck me um, the first time I read Keats's poem, Ode to a Grecian Urn, in high school, where he calls the urn a friend to man. Mm -hmm. And it struck me, even then, as an odd thing to say. Mm -hmm. And later I would have formulated and say, the Grecian urn, Keats is befriended by mm -hmm. the Grecian urn and that we are befriended by art. And I suppose I had a sense of my early days when I, when I moved from you know, writing diary entries to beginning to write poems. I had a sense that I needed other poetry mm -hmm. to help deliver me to my own life and my own feelings. It's a sense that the, that the muse isn't really inside you, that it, you have to be going out to it to make the gestures and finding, finding the guides. Even if it's inside, I mean, there's always an element of rational and irrational elements in the writing of poetry. <laughs> Remember in his defense of poetry, Shelley says, not even the greatest poet can say, I will write poetry. Mm -hmm. That poetry is never entirely at the dispensation of the will. Mm -hmm. So you can call it the collective unconscious, you can call it the muse, you can call it other poets, you can call it something inside of you, you can call it the Freudian unconscious, but there is something that is out, you can call it the demonic. Mm -hmm. Whatever name you want to give to it, it's the recognition that there's something that's beyond rational consciousness mm -hmm. in the writing of poetry and that you need help mm -hmm. to somehow get to that mm -hmm. thing. And um, prayer is one mode, calling out, help me, O oh, heavenly muse, is the recognition mm -hmm. of the poet's objection before a force that he or she can't mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. and, Sh and Shelley also, uh, Borges talks about this, but Shelley also recognizes or wants to recognize that what he's doing as a poet is writing the one poem. Right. One. That, that all poets are participating in this event, which is much larger, yet in some ways very similar, uh, although it's demarcated by different cultural signs. Well, um, you know, Shelley's a Platonist. Yeah. And there's that sense that it's aspiring to some ideal, some ideal thing. Do you find, uh, we should read another poem, but the poet at seven, how do you feel it's directly talking to it, Rambo? It actually, it, I think in this particular poem, it, it borrows an idea from Rambo that is the idea, the quasi pre Freudian <coughs> idea, but very much related to what Freud discovered, um, that, you know, the child is, is, is the father to the man. Uh -huh. And that the, that the roots of your character are rooted in some childhood experiences. And the idea of Rambeau that the poet, you know, long before he ever became a poet, was one in his imagination. Mm -hmm. Rambeau's poem is very much about wild and visionary imagination. Mm -hmm. I just took the idea, and it, I liked the idea so much I applied it to something mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. which is to turn it to my own life. That is, Rambeau gave me the idea and the, the, the thing I wanted to apply to my own life was the sense that on one hand you could be living an ordinary middle class experience as mm -hmm. the boy is living in this poem and in some other way some other stranger fate mm -hmm. is brewing for you mm -hmm. which is your vocation as a poet. Mm -hmm. But also, also uh, as you were reading this I was thinking about how many of your early influences are East European poets and they're, they're not necessarily, although Frost and Whitman and Dickinson certainly were important influences, uh, some of the, the first ones that come into your work are uh, European, East European especially. And the portrait of the boy here is very much is, is attuned to that. Yeah, well, there's something American on the surface. Yeah. But the other thing is, you know, some old, much older culture. Which is something that I, I've always felt uh, makes your, your poetry unique and complex as, as opposed to other poets of... Uh, our generation is that in some ways you start very deeply uh, and profoundly curious about East European poetry and it's it's not as if it's at the center of your work but you bring it in and it meets Whitman it meets uh, Dickinson and Stevens well I love American poetry and you know we are <laughs> American poets there's no getting away from that but I also you know when we started out reading poetry we were thrilled by poetry that we read in translation. 
And I was thrilled by Lorca and Hernandez and Neruda and Nazem Hikmet, and then the Central and Eastern Europeans in particular. And I heard things in their poetry, even in translation, that I recognized mm -hmm. and that somehow belonged to me and to my culture mm -hmm. and that tied me to something much older. And I didn't hear those tones in American mm -hmm. poetry. And I thought American poetry was the poorer for it. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with a relationship to history. It had to do with certain qualities of feeling, like tenderness. Mm -hmm. And that what I loved about a poet such as the Hungarian poet Miklos Radnati was the combination of intellect and feeling. Mm -hmm. And in American poetry, so often it was as if we were made to choose mm -hmm. between one or the other. And it was very natural for the Central European poets not to choose. They're poets of deep feeling and they're poets of high intellect. And um, they helped lead me to the idea that you didn't have to sacrifice one at the price of the other. Uh -huh. Let's, let's have another poem. Okay. Um, I was thinking maybe of something very American. Good. Um, in response, um, called Ocean of Grass. Um, you'll see it's a kind of, um, it's, a, it's a kind of homage to our pioneer mothers. And um, it's a poem about the landscape. I'm from Chicago, and it's really a poem about the landscape of the Midwest. Mm -hmm. There's wonderful local histories now of um, and I had been reading a lot of diaries of women from Kansas and Nebraska. And I'd always loved Willa Cather. And I, I wanted to write a poem that somehow tried to honor the, um, the loneliness mm. and the isolation that so many of those women felt when they came to the Midwest. So, Ocean of Grass. The ground was holy, but the wind was harsh. An unbroken prairie stretched for hundreds of miles so that all she could see was an ocean of grass. Some days she got so lonely, she went outside and nestled among the sheep for company. The ground was holy, but the wind was harsh, and prairie fire swept across the plains, lighting up the country like a vast tinder box until all she could see was an ocean of flames. She went three years without viewing a tree. When her husband finally took her on a timber run she called the ground holy and the wind harsh and got down on her knees and wept inconsolably and lived in a sod hut for 30 more years until the world dissolved in an ocean of grass. Think of her sometimes when you pace the earth, our mother, where she was laid to rest. The ground was holy, but the wind was harsh for those who drowned in an ocean of grass. Mm. It's a villanelle. It's a villanelle. Uh, not a very American form. <laughs> <laughs> but what, uh, what's appropriate, I guess, for the subject is the obsessiveness. And uh, it seems to me it's, a, a, I think villanelles are, are one of the more difficult forms to work in, uh, French forms to work in, in English. Um, well, a lot goes on the two lines, the repetition of the two lines. Yeah, but what I think what works here in this poem, and, and maybe you, you talk about it, is the the way in which the obsession and the and, and the darkness uh, are married in in the poem, and that the landscape itself, the the repetitiveness of the landscape, then becomes imitated. In there's in, in something the very you know there's as you say. In the Villanelle has its roots in Italian folk <coughs> song, and it's a very, it's a very repetitive, mm -hmm. very compulsive form. And I think most Villanelles fail when you read them um, because they, are, they mostly announce that they're Villanelle mm -hmm. and that the repetitions don't gain power as they grow. I mean, it seems to me that if a Villanelle is going to mean something, that every time in this poem you say the ground was holy but the wind was harsh, it has to mean something a little more and a mm -hmm. little different than what it meant mm -hmm. before. It has to accrue meanings. And I think that the refrain works, what I tried to make work in the poem was the refrain in tandem with the detail. Mm -hmm. And each detail is so, I mean, the I didn't make most of them up, I found them. Uh -huh. And the, tales, the details are so haunting of, you know, the woman who goes out and 
you know, nestles the sheep because she's so lonely, the woman who doesn't see a tree for three years and kneels down and begins weeping, the woman who goes back and, you know, has to live in a sod hut for another three mm -hmm. decades. I mean, the details are almost unbearable. And the, 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 I, wanted, I thought the Villanelle might give a choral feeling to the mm -hmm. poem and that the repetitions would enlarge the experience beyond a single person and that they would w and that it would keep coming back to the o to the land itself and the isolation of the land and that you know cather like image of an ocean of grass mm -hmm. and um, and and the dual duality of the experience the ground being holy or sacred but the harshness of the wind with these very particular details mm -hmm. um, of what you know the pioneer experience yeah. was like for you know thousands of women yeah. I, I love the phrase it kind of if, if you block it out all, all on its own, uh, a timber run. Oh, it's a Western. Well, no, it, it, what's interesting about it is, is you, you realize that for them to get wood, they, they would have to go out and get it, yeah. and it becomes a, uh, a, a kind of pilgrimage yeah. to the, the, the thing that's not there. Yeah, on the well, prairie. you're a Westerner, and that it wasn't, it, you, know, you didn't have to do that in the West, but in the Midwest, they yeah. had, you had to go a long way. You'd go a lo very long way without seeing a tree. Yeah in, you know, Illinois, Kansas, Nebraska. Right. I mean, it's really a flat, rolling country, and so you want to get timber, you've got to go a long way to go yeah. and get it. It's a really big deal. Yeah. I mean, it was really a revelation to me to think about, you know, looking out for, you know, hundreds of miles and not seeing See, anything. Right. And I think it's part of the tremendous, many women mention in their diaries, the tremendous loneliness yeah. that, they, that they felt. Yeah. You know, I was working with the metaphor and the idea of ocean of grass. I was really struck thinking about my own poem that Paul Valere, a great French poet, had the idea that you're given, he called it un ligne donné, a given line. Mm. He thought that everything else was work in a poem and that you're given one line uh -huh. as a gift. And, you know, I was working really hard on my villanelle and I was really accumulating the details and trying to build the structure and I was working the line of ocean of grass and then the given line, the thing that's exciting in writing poetry is something you hadn't thought of. It's, for me, it was as uh -huh. if it was waiting there all along, the idea of drowning in an ocean of mm. grass. It had just been waiting for mm. me to blood it till I, till I got there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, there's, it's back to this mystery of the combination of the thing that you make consciously and then some other unconscious element yeah. that needs to kick in. And I think it, it's something like that, that in the Villanelle, it, it in some ways erases the sense of the structure, the skeleton of, of, of Villanelle, and gives it a real heart. Well, um, I also downplay the rhyming very strongly, uh -huh. and I had the poem earlier rhyming very strongly, and I couldn't bear it. Mm -hmm. It was just too song-like, mm -hmm. and it somehow it seemed to take away from um, the dissonance of the experience. Yeah. And so I, I lightened the rhymes a little bit to uh, and moved it away from rhyming to create some other, uh -huh. you know, more naturalistic sounding experience. Now, these two poems come from your most recent book on love. And uh, the book is divided into two parts. I'm going to characterize it real quickly so we can get you to read uh, for a final poem, uh, one of the poems that takes place in the second part. But there are two, two parts to the book. And the first part of the book are shorter lyrics that usually dwell on uh, a specific moment, just, just generally. But the, 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 sec the first section culminates in a series of poems about love. Um, very beautiful and intense poems. Thank you. Um, the second part of the book are uh, really uh, personae-like poems in which you use uh, literary figures uh, to give lecture-like uh, discussions about, about love. And would you read one of those and talk sure. a little bit about how, how those poems began to get written and... Um, the book, I mean, you really thank you for seeing that the book is a whole and that the, f the more personal poems modulate into the first part of my own voice, modulate into a poem called Husband and Wife, um, which is really a personal love poem about a couple coming together and separating. Um, it's about their being together physically and then going to the window and being separate. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to frame this larger symposium with these personal poems. The symposium itself 
um, is 25 different poems in which different speakers from the past each give his or her own, own ideas about love. And um, I think the first part, in some ways, they're all versions of myself, mm -hmm. and I wanted it to very much give a suggestion of opening out from the personal section to this ar larger thing. But then um, each of the speakers is a historical personage. Mm -hmm. um, it begins with Diderot and moves through Baudelaire and Heine and Margaret Fuller and various 19th century figures through you know, George Meredith and, and um, Oscar Wilde and various others. And it really tries to be a kind of encyclopedia of love. Mm -hmm. And um, the central subject holding it all together is it's really about, I feel, the way that lovers come together and separate. It's about the blur where they become a union of more than one, or more than two, blur into mm -hmm. somehow one. And then it seems to me that that ecstatic state is impossible to stay in, and then they separate back into two. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's, the poems are this accordion-like structure of moving together and moving apart. So maybe I'll read you the last one. Yeah, read read the that's Colette. That's Colette. Colette's and, voice, and uh, and then um, maybe if we have a little bit of time, you can talk about some of the formal okay issues you you were working with. Colette gets the last word. My beloved French writer Colette <laughs> gets the last word because I decided that she knew the most about erotic love, <laughs> and so she decides to you know after listening to this symposium of a couple of centuries. She decides to give the last, the last thing yeah. about about love. So she's the speaker, and I mean, through in all these poems, someone who very clearly is a historical personage, not me, is directly the yeah. speaker. So Colette's the speaker in this. My mother used to say, "Sit down, dear, and don't cry. The worst thing for a woman is her first man, the one who kills you. After that, marriage becomes a long career." Poor Cito. She never had another career, and she knew firsthand how love ruins you. The seducer doesn't care about his woman, even as he whispers endearments in her ear. Never let anyone destroy your inner spirit. Among all the forms of truly absurd courage, the recklessness of young girls is outstanding. Otherwise, there would be far fewer marriages and even fewer affairs that overwhelm marriages. Look at me. It's amazing I'm still standing after what I went through with ridiculous courage. I was made to suffer, but no one broke my spirit. Every woman wants her adventure to be a feast of ripening cherries and peaches, Marseille figs, hothouse grapes, champagne shuddering in crystal. Happiness, we believe, is on sumptuous display. But unhappiness writes a different kind of play. The gypsy gazes down into a clear blue crystal and sees rotten cherries and withered figs. Trust me, loneliness too can be a feast. Ardor is delicious, but keep your own room. <laughs> One of my husbands said, is it impossible for you to write a book that isn't about love, adultery, semi-incestuous relations, separation? Of course, this was before our own separation. <laughs> He never understood the natural law of love, the arc from the possible to the impossible. I have extolled the tragedy of the bedroom. We need exact descriptions of the first passion, so pay attention to whatever happens to you. Observe everything. Love is greedy and forgetful. By all means, fling yourself wildly into life, though sometimes you will be flung back by life but don't let experience make you forgetful and be surprised by everything that happens to you. We are creative creatures fueled by passion. One final thought about the nature of love. Freedom should be the first condition of love and work is liberating. A novel about love cannot be written while you are making love. Never underestimate the mysteries of love the eminent dignity of not talking about love. Passionate attention is prayer. Prayer is love. Savor the world. Consume the feast with love. Mm. Wonderful. I, I like especially how the, the obsession of love, which is really the subject of, of the book, of course, gets played out uh, both passionately, obsessively, again, humorously, um, 
at the very end because all the words right. in the last stanza are yeah, the love. last eight lines all begin. Oh, love. <laughs> well, the last lines all <laughs> end with the word love. How can we escape so it? It's like, yeah, it's like a hammer. It just keeps. It seemed funny to me. Yeah. But it also seemed but it's, summary and compulsive. Yeah. To me. It's it, it's it's uh, appropriate to the book. It just keeps coming back. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there's a lot of repetition, as you know, in these poems. But at the end, I wanted to not keep the repetition so distant. Mm -hmm. Often they're far apart from each other. But mm -hmm. here, I just wanted them to keep mm -hmm. coming. Yeah. Uh, keep coming so that it would be really close yeah. to really summarize. Yeah. It, it also solves the problem of what do you do with all the voices that have come before. You, you do create this huge chorus at the end. Well, I was writing the Colette poem individually, and as soon as I wrote it, I knew it, I wanted it to be the last poem in the uh -huh. sequence, even though it wasn't the last poem I wrote. But I knew that it had this, because it had these uh, uh, you know, eight repetitions of the word love, it had a tremendous choral or summary <laughs> feeling. And the, the, you know, the summary seemed to me the right thing to conclude all these voices to end the symposium. Uh -huh. What are you working on now? I've got a group of poems that I'm very fond of um, called the Desire Manuscripts, in which in every poem a lover addresses the beloved through the scrim of a classic text. Mm. They thr he thrusts them into some situation of the metamorphosis or the odyssey or something mm. like that. Um, so that's been my poetic project, and I've been writing a critical work. The next thing after How to Read a Poem is um, a book that takes up the subject of artistic inspiration. I use Garcia Lorca's idea of, of duende, which is something like artistic inspiration in the presence of death, mm -hmm. um, to explore further the thing that we talked about a little bit about the, the relationship between the irrational and the demonic elements in poetry, mm -hmm. what Keats calls my demon posy, and the element of consciousness and making. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go a little further in exploring yeah. artistic inspiration. Sounds wonderful. Thanks. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, Edward. It's delicious to talk to you. <laughs> and thank you for joining us on uh, another edition of The Writing Life. Join the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society for a celebration of distinguished writers. Hoko Polizzo brings nationally and internationally recognized authors to both stage and screen. The Writing Life features a personal look at these writers and their craft. For more information on this prize-winning nonprofit organization, call 410-730-7524 or visit our website.